Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. You're watching Disruptive Investing. During Tesla's Q2 earnings call last Wednesday, this question was asked. How many Optimus bots uh, have been made and when will they be able to start performing useful tasks? And we heard Elon say this. 10 million. <laughs> Obviously, he's joking. But when will Tesla bot be walking around? Around November-ish. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll start ra ramping up after that. And when will it be able to do some useful things? You know, in terms of when will it be able to do some useful things? We'll, we'll, like, we'll first be trying this out in our own factories and just proving out its utility. But I, I, think, I think we'll be able to have it do something useful in our factories sometime next year. Now, I know that for most people, Tesla's a car company. They make $100,000 luxury cars, right? Most people still have no clue what Tesla is up to. We talk about it all the time on Tesla Time News, as we have been doing for the past eight years. Tesla makes EVs, of course, but they also make batteries and motors and computers and software and stationary battery packs like Powerwalls and Megapacks and develop autonomous driving systems and dojo training supercomputers and virtual power plants and now humanoid autonomous robots. They took the same hardware and software that they've been working on for the past few years to allow their cars to drive around autonomously, and they are now putting that same technology into a Tesla bot, which will also be able to move around autonomously and do useful tasks. Do you see how disruptive this is, people? The Tesla Q2 earnings call took place last Wednesday after the closing bell. And what happened to Tesla stock price after that? Well, it dropped 8%. Dropped eight, it dropped 8%? <laughs> Look, not only was it a record-breaking quarter for Tesla, record-breaking auto production, record-breaking deliveries, but also record revenue, $24.9 billion in revenue, an additional $700 million put into the bank, so they have over $18 billion in the bank. All this expansion they're doing with virtually no debt. They have, I think, $44 million in debt, which is the equivalent of having like $2 on your credit card. And now a new product coming soon. A new product, by the way, which nobody else makes and everybody will want. You mean the Cybertruck? Oh, forgot about that one. No, I'm talking about the humanoid robot. Well, I mean, but I mean, of course, it's, 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 it, their margins dropped to 9% and that's uh, bad. That's bad. 9% margins you gotta on find, selling a car? <laughs> you got to find something to complain about. 9% margins selling a car? That's horrible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> VW would dream of having those margins. <laughs> They're shooting for like... Six. They're like, what was it? Six or... Yeah, VW's shooting for like 6.4 They're like in they're like, like five years. And that's their like... That's their big mission. Right. They're like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get to 6%. It, Tesla's at 9, and they're like, well, it dropped. It was at 14. Now it dropped down to 9. That's terrible. Yeah. Tesla's basically passing on all of their uh, money savings, and they're passing it on to buyers by lower prices, which means they get bigger market share. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> we're talking about robots. Why here. would you want market share now? Why would you ever want market share? It's all about margins. Don't sell any cars. But make a margin, even though know, the other car companies don't make margins on any of their EVs. Oh, they make negative margins. Okay, so back to the robot. Do you want one? And, and don't say, I don't know, what will it do? Yeah, because even if all it can do at first is slowly mow your lawn or get you a beer from the fridge, it will be one of the most demanded products in history. And do you know why? Because it's not even you that it's designed for yet. Like Elon said, it'll be doing useful things around Tesla's factories first. It'll be building things. This robot, <laughs> he hasn't said this, but it's designed to help humanity get to Mars. Elon set his sights so high, a humanoid robot that can help build cities on Mars, that even if he doesn't hit the mark right away, Tesla bot will still be super useful. Just pushing a lawnmower is hugely useful. Just using a broom or a paintbrush. These are difficult tasks, by the way, don't get me wrong, making a robot that can even you know, mow your lawn. But compared to what Elon envisions these Tesla bots doing soon, these simple tasks that we talk about are nothing. And we talked about a lot of this and the value of Tesla bot in this in depth here on the end of human labor. I suggest if you're interested in finding out more about what we think is going to happen, you should check that out. And that's the hardest part, I think, about this whole discussion. It's imagining what it will look like. It's believing that it's going to happen very soon. For most of us, though, it's just science fiction. We've seen the movies. We all know what the robots can do. They can take over the world and kill all humanity, right? That's the fun part they show in science fiction movies, right? Sure. But they also do plenty of mundane, laborious tasks. And that's the part that most science fiction movies don't focus on because that would be boring. We're about to have, and by about, I mean probably within the next two years, a useful, 
economical, mass-produced humanoid robot. And no one sees it coming. Well, except some of you here. This is what disruptive technology looks like. You're taking multiple technologies, putting them together into one incredible product. We're talking electric battery and motor technology. We're talking AI software. We're talking AI hardware. All things that Tesla is very good at. All things that Tesla is very good at building economically at scale. And while the robot itself is disruptive, imagine how disruptive it can be. What, what do you mean? Well, up until now, one of the limiting factors when building almost anything big is what? Um, money? Yeah, but go a bit deeper. So we're talking about like building a bridge or a tunnel? Sure, yeah. Any Anything big, like a skyscraper, a tunnel, a hyperloop. Okay, so materials? Yeah, but again, go one step deeper. To get materials like cement and concrete and steel, you need a lot of labor. Mm. Labor is not free. That's why we keep going to countries where labor is cheaper and cheaper looking for cheap labor. Tesla bot is the ultimate in cheap labor, as we talked about on that in depth. Right. You don't have to pay for bathroom breaks and HR departments and lost workday due to injury or sickness. Heck, you don't even have to have a parking lot for them because they never go home. They just work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Right. It's the ultimate in cheap labor. And you don't even have to feel bad about it. Right. And when we all have this cheap labor, we're going to be able to build projects that we've never been able to afford building before all over the world. New tunnels, new buildings, new bridges, new spaceports, new desalination plants. And that's going to be super duper disruptive. I think that a lot of people kind of forget <laughs> when we're talking about America, especially. And, you know, you see the picture of the guys sitting on the skyscraper. You know, that's that famous picture. And they're all eating lunch on an I-beam hundreds of feet above the ground with no safety equipment on or anything like that. And we kind of forget what those people were, that they were immigrants. Mm -hmm. And we kind of forget how we treated immigrants mm -hmm. in this country. We still treat immigrants poorly in this country. But uh, that that's kind of what built this country was very cheap labor from right. people who had no other better options. Why do you think our infrastructure is falling apart? Do you have that cheap labor anymore? Is it legal to hire people for for no money and also? Do you know how many people died on projects that you just talked about? <laughs> right, and no one cared, and like, we romanticize it. It was like, like, well, he fell off the beam, but that... we'll put another one up there tomorrow. <laughs> it's not a big deal. Don't worry, he was Irish <laughs> and replaceable. <laughs> and that's like that's robots, right? Except if a robot falls, it's like, oh, a robot fell. We'll have to replace his motor. And I think that that's kind of the thing that we don't really think about is that. We had really cheap labor back then. And, you know, I, I'm sure I'm not 100 percent correct, but I'm just saying you can't tell me that we're not going to have like a new golden age with these robots. Totally. And I mean, I want you to think about a part of this country that was just basically desert for the longest time. Right. If you look at like New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada. Right. You couldn't live there practically. What came along? One technology, air conditioning, mm. which changed the entire landscape, right? That one technology disrupted a desert into a place where people could live. And now you have businesses and all sorts of things. You have Las Vegas. You have Las Vegas, right? So that one technology, we're talking about multiple technologies enabling you to build this robot, which we cannot even imagine. It's your imagination that is holding you back now from seeing how valuable this is. And that's why we're talking about it on disruptive investing. Mm -hmm. Do you get where I'm going with this, folks? Look, we're not financial advisors. Don't take our advice as financial advice. Don't just run out there and buy some company that makes robot stock. Think about it. Do your own research. But what well, I'm saying is never before in history has this happened. And this is the only company that I can foresee it happening with. Now, let's just take a step back. Well, let's say he starts selling the robots to other companies. To you mean leasing them? Uh, leasing whatever. <laughs> However I think it's I think can, it's RAS, robot as a service. Sure. Whatever however you can get your hands on this robot, whatever companies those are, whether they're building contractors, heck, even landscapers mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Yep. I think that those companies are probably going to be massively successful. I don't know why. Maybe it's because their labor costs are going to be uh, what next I don't think we're understanding is our economy is going to uh, economy is just labor. Right. It's just the goods and services that you produce, but you produce them with labor. So when you reduce labor to almost zero, your economy, the value of your economy goes to almost infinity. We're going to have a pretty much limitless economy. We're going to have so much wealth. The bigger questions are going to be how do we we're, we've gone from scarcity 
to abundance and we're going to go to super duper abundance. And that's the part where we're going to have to do some more thinking because we're not used to that. We're not used mm -hmm. to living. I mean, we have a lot of abundance, but not like the amounts we're going to have. That's what we have to be thinking about is like, what's life going to even look like? And I think that, and that it's not going to be a hundred years from now, people. That's what I'm saying. Elon just said on the earnings call, they're going to have a useful robot early next year. Right. This is where I think a lot of people just want to start to bury their heads in the sand. They go like, that sounds like a lot of thinking. That sounds like a lot of work of trying to figure out what the heck that even means. And you're absolutely right. And this is why a lot of people kind of pawn off their investments to other people, right? So, and if that's you, good, then do that. Then have someone else do your investing for you. But what I'm saying is those people probably are not thinking this way. They're probably going to put it into some whole home investments to make sure that you get your 4% a year. If you want to have disruption in your investment portfolio, unfortunately, you're pretty much the one who's going to have to do it. And so if you want to put the work in, that's exactly right what Jesse said. You're going to have to put your thinking caps on. You're going to have to think about what the future looks like. And you're going to have to think, how much of my portfolio am I going to risk on really high upside, but very risky investments? Mm. So anyway, I hope we give you a little bit to think about. Um, it's, and, it's, and if you want to talk about more of this, head on over to our Patreon. That's where we have our investor club and our investor club members. They pay a little bit more to help support us, but we do a whole lot for them and with them. We have a Slack over there where we talk about this stuff all the time. We have investor club bonus stories where we talk about this stuff. And we invite CEOs and startup founders to talk about this stuff all the time. We'll see you over there. Thanks for joining us on Disruptive Investing.